it also can lead to rather glib assessments by pegging us to electoral fortunes. There's a new survey of conservative history out there entitled The Rise and Fall of Conservatism. And the election of Obama is framed as the end, while well, conservatism is lost. <laughs> and I, I think that's too um, maybe comforting, but I think it's good. Um, and then I think there's another assumption when we focus just on the movement, is that conservatism becomes inherently reactionary or reactional. It becomes, in Huntington, Samuel Huntington's <coughs> description, a situational ideology. So it's, available, it's pushing back against something. It has no essential nature. It has no fixed core. Um, and I think there are obviously elements of conservatism that are reactionary or do push back against change. I think that's one way to look at conservatism. I'm also convinced there is an essential core of beliefs and ideas um, that are not simply reactionary. That, in other words, you can't just put people in any context and say, well, now the people in Russia are trying to conserve the gains of the Bolshevik Revolution, those are really conservatives. I think we start to dilute what, what we mean. So I think there is something essential that we should examine that maybe we don't examine when we get stuck in this more narrow definition. What would be some of these constituent elements of conservatism we'd want to pay attention to? Um, two, I think, are really interesting are um, defense of elitism and comfort with hierarchy. I think this is very constitutive of conservative thought in many different places. Neither of these mesh well with the American political tradition, right? We're a democracy. We've had trouble um, since a few decades after we were founded with making self-conscious arguments in favor of aristocracy or elite rule. So they go underground. And I think we're missing this really pivotal transition. Somewhere around the 50s, conservatives figure out how to be populist, how to engage popular rhetoric, how to either veil or maybe they actually let go of some of these long-standing ideas in elite, about elitism or hierarchy. I'm not sure. I haven't you know, sat down and really struggled with it. It's something I wrestled with with Rand, who both invokes sort of populist ideas of every person is worthy, and then extremely elitist ideas about the giants who really run the show. Um, and so I think there's I think there's some still some tensions there, but I think that's this really profound transition if we're looking at conservatism in a longer time scale, how it learns <coughs> to um, use the sort of tropes and ideas of political campaigning and how it really effectively creates a sort of liberal elite, um, the dangerous arugula eaters and limousine liberals that become the sort of um, the reverse image of what real Americans or conservative Americans are. So, um, and then uh, in terms of focusing on electoral politics and Republican Party, another figure, and here I'm going to um, co-opt our missing panelist. Um, <laughs> Michael Kimmage was this, uh, originally slated to be on this panel. Um, he is uh, come for various personal reasons. And he's just published a book that sets Lionel Trilling and Whitaker Chambers in dialogue and really traces out many of the similarities of these two figures from their Columbia milieu to their reaction, um, their, their attraction to modernism, their reaction against it, and their joint movement to what he calls a conservative turn. And it's very interesting for me reading this book that there are a lot of ways in which you could say Trilling is more conservative in some essential and maybe characterological way than Chambers, who really never sort of sheds his revolutionary Bolshevistic orientation. And so um, that to me is really interesting. Maybe Trilling, this exemplar of mid-century liberalism, has some really powerful conservative strains in him. But we'll never see that if we talk about the movement, because Trilling was very, very uh, careful to stay as far as he could from political conservatism and very um, was offended. If anyone called him a conservative, which to me suggests some of the anxiety of influence that he was so that was so problematic for him that he might be classified there. So I think. Um, there's a lot who don't fit the model. Um, there's some very influential people. There's places we can see this um, sets of conservative ideas or conservative traditions. And my final point about the, the problem of the movement would be that then it tethers us to 1950 forward. It makes it really hard to go past this sort of World War II becomes a Rubicon. It makes it hard to go earlier. Um, and that has a host of um, analytic consequences. Anti-communism looms large, um, race relations loom large, um, anti-statism 
and business activism get shrunk down. And I think there's some really good new work. Kim Phillips Fine has a whole book on business activism that um, takes us back to the 30s and, and looks at the New Deal as really foundational. So maybe the New Deal is where we should start. Maybe we should go back to the 20s. And I would say here, I'm not saying we should go and be looking at you know figures like the Southern Agrarians, these tiny uh, magazine writers. I think they're influential. I think there's some great work on them. But I think their ideas have fewer consequences than we might hope. And here I would say, let's put on our cultural hat and let's try to look at some of the popular discourses and popular movement of ideas and not just um, the, these intellectuals. Because I think what the story is, is in the 50s, a small group are tapping into these broader understandings that have not been served by um, those who work with words and those who work with formal discourses. They're picking them up. So I think when we go back before 45, we'll find a lot of things lying around that later get picked up, and then we'll see some continuity because I think this came up in our last session. How can this incredibly successful social movement germinate out of nowhere and last for 50 years if it's not drawing on some really uh, fundamental and foundational things? So that's been quite a lot to deal with. So I'll just say really quickly, the second piece I would think about is just urging us to look at um, uh, American conservative history in a more broad European context. Um, and again, not simply as, as a vector of influence. That was, again, one of my critiques of Nash. You have this sort of dormant, passive America, and then these fiery emigres from Europe come and teach us all how to you know, see what's really happening. I think there's a lot more, um, I think it goes both ways. I think there's a lot more here that gets triggered by Europe, and then Europe becomes the huge object lesson of where we might go if we're not careful. And I also think it would help our field to engage across national boundaries. I think there's a lot of interest in American conservatism in other countries. Um, it's something that they're very curious about. They'd like to know more about it. And I think us beginning to explore the different connections will help us join in that conversation. And I think also across our own subfield, you know, there's not a, a field in American history that's not looking transnationally or looking internationally. I think there's a reason for that, and I think there's ways for us to communicate um, across those fields if we take a broader scope. Now, I think um, Angus's work probably speaks to that more specifically, and uh, this came up a bit in the paper, uh, the Nauper's paper on Leo Strauss, that, you know, Strauss is really part of this European conversation and comes to America, and that gets shorn sure off, but it's still a very in important influence in it. So I'll stop there. I put a lot of stuff on the table. i um, very interested to hear people's thoughts or reactions, and um, hopefully uh, read some interesting stuff a few years down the line. Thanks. Mm -hmm.